Okay, as we're hitting the noon hour here on the dot, I uh, just wanted <clears throat> to remind everybody to uh, please put your name, title, and affiliation uh, in the box so we can uh, make sure we get credit. Uh, the other point that uh, I, I wanted to make uh, in terms of logistics for these meetings um, is that we will uh, provide a, a stipend going forward for um, uh, kind of like a piecemeal stipend uh, for facilities to uh, 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 help them collect data. And uh, so we'll be sending out a, a memo on that. Uh, so basically the request is to uh, generate uh, data for your metrics and measurements of quality improvement and then by uh, delivering those to our program, then we will uh, reimburse you for that. And it'll be a nominal stipend. Um, and there was one other th thought that I had was, well, today um, I just wanted to um, indicate that our plan is to engage uh, real-time QAPI um, activities and so you'll see as we march through. So today, uh, one of the uh, goals, which I'm, I'm hoping everybody uh, finds uh, valuable is to do our annual QAPI assessment pro program. And so you'll, um, we'll, we'll walk everybody through that and we'll do it as a poll so we can see where everybody is in terms of the range of their uh, QAPI uh, preparedness. So, um, so anyway, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's move on with today's session. Uh, today, we're going to uh, talk about uh, leadership and change. Uh, the agenda today is to uh, recall, and I, I, ho I hope you'll appreciate the, uh, the word recall as opposed to remember um, as we move along in our slide deck here uh, as to what we learned last week. Uh, we want to look towards leadership uh, and change. Uh, we'll do our QAPI self-assessment. Uh, you'll um, hopefully have your sheets to uh, fill out. If not, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you another copy of those sheets. But uh, just as if somebody in your group has not uh, yet downloaded and printed the QAPI self-assessment uh, form, uh, please do so um, while we're at it here. So you can have that at the ready uh, for later on in this presentation. And then uh, finally, we'll, we'll talk about uh, preparations for next week to start launching our uh, PIP program. Next slide, please. So the goals today uh, is we want, we'd like to get some feedback uh, to share what, what happened with your walk rounds uh, over the last week. Uh, we want to talk about developing this culture of change and um, also describe uh, what, what, what we consider and discuss resident-centered uh, care. Next slide, please. And we wanted to acknowledge our uh, peer mentors. And so one of the things in these collaborations is to really have everybody participate. Um, and we, we've uh, reached out to Missouri Slopes, uh, Wishak and Rosewood uh, to um, uh, act as uh, peer mentors and to uh, help uh, facilitate or be a catalyst uh, for our discussions uh, as we're moving forward in quality improvement. And we hope to add to this list of peer mentorship. Uh, I mean, the idea is that we all kind of share our ideas with one another and we then uh, can really develop uh, best practices, uh, both based upon experiences and then also uh, what we consider evidence-based medicine as to what those best practices uh, uh, should be. Okay, next slide, please. So if you're wondering, uh, is this, I had this premonition, I, I don't know if you heard earlier, but I had a cat visit me last night in my, uh, my, at my home. Uh, I have no idea, it must have been a stray cat looking to get indoors for some warmth. Uh, so I guess it was kind of propitious that I have this uh, uh, cat mm -hmm. peeking over the table as to who's here. Uh, but you can see all, all of our participants here. And I think we pretty much have everybody. If you don't see your name on the list, uh, please uh, just uh, put it in the chat box and, and, and let us know so we can uh, add, add you to the list here. Okay, next, next slide, please. So here we go, total recall. So last week we uh, talked about uh, walk rounds as a way to get quality improvement uh, information 
And so what we're hoping to do, and uh, you know, with Arnold Schwarzenegger there, I don't know how long this movie's like 30 years old uh, with his total recall, uh, but we would like to um, uh, get feedback as to how uh, folks thought that their walk rounds uh, occurred. So let's have the next slide, please. So just as a reminder, uh, we wanted uh, to introduce the concept of a scripted uh, walk round. Uh, so these are some of the uh, uh, commentaries to open up a uh, walk round. Um, so we want to, want to focus on uh, that second line there. We want to focus on the system, not individuals. Uh, so these are reminders to people that you engage on walk rounds. Again, these are meant to be conversations. Um, as opposed to less observational, more, more conversational. Um, and again, to stress the confidentiality of the discussions. Uh, the third, uh, fourth point there, uh, these are very general questions. Um, and then the last point, uh, uh, just to give examples of what we're looking for on walk rounds, like was there a, 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 a dropped handoff or you know, a miscommunication? Uh, do you have the resources that you need to do your job? Uh, were there any inefficiencies that you noted? And uh, anything uh, that changed and falls and or uh, policies or protocols not followed? So these are all kind of uh, inquiries that you want to do. But again, they're, they're structured, right? You know, you have these written down. Uh, you, you ask them as, as opposed to a freelance or uh, ad hoc uh, approach. Next slide, please. So uh, once you get those introductory questions uh, uh, started, then you can uh, march through these specific questions. Uh, can you think of any incidents uh, where a resident uh, was harmed or had a near miss? Uh, the next question then, is there anything we can do differently to improve safety or infection control? And then the last one, uh, what, just looking at walk rounds, what would you do to make these walk rounds more effective? Again, these are feedback questions, they're structured uh, and uh, they, they help guide the uh, conversation. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of our um, uh, last week's homework, uh, you can see this Giacometti statue here of walk rounds. That's my version of walk rounds. Uh, so in the chat box, could you just please uh, put down if you had walk rounds uh, between our last meeting Wednesday and uh, current? And then this, uh, answer the second question, all in the same chat box, by the way. Uh, did you let, let staff know in advance that you were doing the walk rounds? And then lastly, did you use the uh, scripted rounds that we just uh, uh, reviewed here just a moment ago? So go ahead and take a moment to uh, type in your answer to those three, three questions, and then just, if you don't mind sharing them with us. And again, no, no penalties, no confidentiality issues. <laughs> all the things that we look for in our, our collaboration. This is all meant to be just, you know, supportive. And I actually have to get my chat box open up myself. Okay, so just looking through the, um, Chat box here. Uh, we did do some uh, walk walk rounds. Uh, did not let staff know in advance, uh, and did not use a scripted plan and plan to use in the future. That's 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 wonderful. Um, good. So uh, uh, we get, we've got Cindy who's pointing out they do walk rounds every day. Uh, so I guess one of the questions, Cindy, I would have is that do you do walk rounds with everybody or just uh, do you rotate the walk rounds? Uh, with with um, individuals or you know with the, uh, different units. So like on Monday you do unit one or A, and then the next day you do unit B. Uh, okay, so we got um, yeah, so we got we got folks that are kind of what we call on the readiness curve. Um, so <laughs> didn't participate last week. No no problem. There's always catch up and. Um, Good, good. So people are, it looks like we're for the most part doing uh, walk rounds. Uh, I, so it would be uh, encouraged if you use the scripted rounds and see how that goes for you. So that's that's what we wanna do. So uh, so if we can get on that for next week, uh, that, would, that would be fantastic. And uh, yeah, somebody else does, does walk rounds every day. 
and schedule rotations, rotating each uh, uh, five units and then rotate uh, pips. Uh, that's kind of an interesting approach. All righty, good. Well, thank you for those responses. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So same thing, I want you to uh, just, if you don't mind, uh, think about uh, the walk rounds uh, and identify uh, for those that do, did do the walk rounds, something that you uh, discovered that was both uh, positive and a, uh, just one, one problem that you may have uh, also discovered. So again, in the chat box, something that was positive and something that may be more on the negative uh, problematic side. So we'll just give a few minutes here for people to uh, type that in. Hey, Dr. Jarevich, it's Kelly. Oh, hi, Kelly. Hi, I just wanted to say, I put it in the chat box, but I'm not sure if Liz saw it. Liz was one that um, said she did use a scripted um, walk rounds. And I just wanted to know, Liz, if you would be willing to share that with everybody um, for maybe the next session to see what you use. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was a three yes, sir. <laughs> That's a hat trick. <laughs> okay, great. So Cindy is pointing out that uh, it's good good communications between CNA. So that that's very qualitative. Uh, that that's that's fantastic. That's exactly what we want to look. Where we're getting coffee burnout. Hmm. All right. Uh, making a schedule is positive. Good. All right. That that's uh, very helpful to structure that. Uh, CNAs came up with a excellent idea in preventing falls. That's good. Uh, so the, the, the question is with uh, tying falls together, um, you know, so you, the question is, you know, whether you tested uh, the idea yet or we'll, we'll test the idea and how to structure that into a PIP. Uh, that, that's really a great idea. Um, you also want to um, consider as you uh, get this information, is to also look at what evidence-based practices are for fall, fall prevention. Uh, so you, you wanna do a little bit of like, this is what we're gonna apply here. And then uh, as we talked about last time, one of the um, uh, standards for fall prevention and long-term care is to uh, have uh, daily uh, vitamin D uh, supplementation. So it's supposed to be a thousand units per day. All right. So um, I'm going to hand off our meeting today to the illustrious Michelle Lochner, <laughs> and she'll walk us through uh, quality improvement uh, and change culture. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Jurevich. Um, we can go to the next slide. We're going to watch a short video here that Kelly actually shared with us. Um, so you guys can go ahead and, and play that, Julie, Sarah. Once long ago in a land far away, there lived four little characters who ran through a maze looking for cheese to nourish them and make them happy. Two were mice named Sniff and Scurry. And two were little people named Ham and Haw. As different as the mice and little people were, they shared one thing in common. Every morning, they left their homes and raced out into the maze to find their favorite cheese. Snip and Scurry had simple brains but good instincts. They used a simple method of trial and error. Sniff would smell out the general direction of the cheese. And Scurry would race ahead. They often went off in the wrong direction and bumped into walls. But Ham and Haw had complex brains with beliefs and emotions that made their life in the maze more complicated and challenging. Finding cheese was important to the little people. It was a way of getting what they thought they needed to be happy. For some, it was having material things. For others, it was health or peace of mind. For Haw, cheese meant living in a cozy cottage with a loving family on Cheddar Lane. To him, cheese meant being a big cheese in a mansion atop Camembert Hill. Eventually, they all discovered their own kind of cheese in Cheese Station C. Every morning after that, Snip and Scurry woke early each day and ran the same route through the maze to Cheese Station C. Snip and Scurry hung their running shoes around their necks in case they needed to get to them quickly. But Ham and Haw awoke each day a little later and sauntered over to Cheese Station C. After all, they knew where the cheese was and how to get there. 
and they assumed it would always be there. Ham and Haw put their running shoes away. They thought they wouldn't be needing them again. This is great! There's enough cheese here to last us forever! Sure is! They felt secure. They even decorated the walls with sayings. Ham and Haw became so comfortable they didn't notice what had been happening. Meanwhile, Sniff and Scurry inspected the area each morning to see if there had been any changes from the day before. One morning, they arrived at Cheese Station C and discovered there was no cheese. They weren't surprised, since they'd noticed the supply of cheese had been getting smaller. The mice did not overanalyze things. The situation had changed, so Sniff and Scurry changed. They were soon off in search of new cheese. Later that day, Ham and Haw arrived at Cheese Station C. They had not been paying attention to the changes that had been taking place. No, no cheese? Who moved my cheese? It's not fair! Hem, Hem, I know we're smarter than mice, but we're not acting like it at the moment. What'll happen if the cheese isn't here tomorrow? I've made plans based on this cheese! While Sniff and Scurry had moved on, Hem and Haw continued to Hem and Haw. One night, Haw wrote on the wall, The more important cheese is to you, the more you want to hold on to it. The next day, Ham and Haw still somehow expected to find their cheese in the same place. Why did they do this to me? Now, where are Sniff and Scurry? Do you think they know something we don't? Nah, they're just simple mice. We're little people. We're entitled to our cheese. Yeah, yeah, but maybe we should just simply get going and find some new cheese. Oh, no. I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. I want things to be the way they were. Meanwhile, Sniff and Scurry moved further into the maze. They didn't think of anything else but finding new cheese. After much trial and error, Sniff and Scurry found the biggest store of cheese they had ever seen at Cheese Station N. Meanwhile, Hem and Haw were still hemming and hawing at empty Cheese Station C. Then, Hall began to imagine himself out in the maze, finding fresh new cheese. Before long, he could almost taste it. Come on, Hem. Let's, let's go. No, I like it here. It's comfortable. Besides, it's real dangerous out there. Ha imagined the worst. His hope of finding new cheese faded. So every day, Hem and Ha went from their homes to Cheeseless Station C and returned home again with empty bellies, full of nothing but stress. Who moved my cheese? Who moved my cheese? Who moved my Ham. cheese? Who Ham, look at us. We keep doing the same things over and over and wonder why things don't get better. It's time to move on. Well, you're not really going out into the maze again. Why don't we wait here until they put the cheese back? You just don't get it. They're never going to put the old cheese back. That was yesterday's cheese. It's time to find new cheese. Oh, but what if there's no cheese out there? Or what if you can't find it? Ham, life moves on, and so should we. No. Who moved my cheese? Who moved my cheese? Who moved my if cheese? If we don't change, we could become extinct. Like him, a part of Haw was afraid. <clears throat> Then Ha wrote on the wall what he had been thinking about. What would you do if you weren't afraid? It wasn't long before Ha knew what to do. Ha gathered all his courage and jogged into the unknown. It's maze time! At first he felt lost. But it wasn't long before he began to find his way. Being back in the maze isn't nearly as bad as I feared. How did I get into this situation? I'd been watching what was happening. Pa stopped to write on the maze wall what he was learning. Smell the cheese often so you know when it's getting old. Pa hoped that these handwritings on the wall would not only be reminders to himself, but also a marked trail for him to follow if he chose to enter the maze. Why do I feel so good? I don't have any cheese, and I don't know where it is. Aha! When you move beyond your fear, 
you feel free. The more clearly Haw imagined himself finding new cheese, the more real it became. Imagining myself enjoying new cheese even before I find it leads me to it. Finally, Haw arrived at a large cheese station. But it was practically empty. I'm too late. If I'd moved on sooner, I might have found a lot of new cheese here. Ha did find several delicious morsels of new cheese. It wasn't much, but enough to keep him going. I've got to get back and, and tell him there's some new cheese out here. Ha raced back to Cheese Station C, following the route he had marked. He found his friend still hemming and hawing. Hem had not even put on his running shoes. Oh, Hem, uh, you look hungry. Uh, here, have a few bits of new cheese. I don't think I would like new cheese. I want my own cheese back. I'm sure if I wait here long enough, things will be the way they were. Will Hem ever change? Hem was left behind. Hemmed in by fear, comfort, and denial. I guess Hem believes he can't or, or won't enjoy new cheese. He seems to believe that if he ventures into the maze, things will get worse. I see now that if I do things differently, things will get better. When you change what you believe, you change what you do. Paul found bits of cheese here and there and began to regain his strength. He had hoped that Ham might find his way by reading the handwriting on the wall. Paul had let go of the past and was adapting to the present. He was pursuing new cheese. And then, it happened. Piled high everywhere was the greatest supply of cheese he had ever seen. Wow! New cheese! Is it real, or just my imagination? It is real! Pa realized that Sniff and Scurry had been enjoying new cheese for quite a while. He vowed that next time, he would change faster. Ha knew it would be easy for him to slip back to his old ways if he got too comfortable. So each day he inspected Cheese Station N to check the condition of his cheese. He went out into the maze and explored new areas. He knew it was safer to be aware of his real choices than to isolate himself in his comfort zone. Then one day Ha heard what he thought was the sound of movement out in the maze. Could it be him? Was Ham about to turn the corner? Pa hoped that maybe, at last, his friend was finally able to move to the new cheese and enjoy it. Can you read the handwriting on the wall? Change happens. They keep moving the cheese. Anticipate change. Smell the cheese often so you know when it's getting old. Adapt to change quickly. The quicker you let go of old cheese, the sooner you can enjoy new cheese. Enjoy change. Savor the adventure and enjoy the taste of new cheese. Be ready to change quickly and enjoy it again. They keep moving the cheese. Okay, so in this little parable, the cheese is a metaphor for what many consider security, safety, or comfort, the way things have always been. And the four characters represent individual responses of how people react when confronted with change. And certainly in long-term care, we are always being confronted with changes, day in and day out, right? Think about all the changes that you and your teams have had to work through. Big changes like phase implementation of the new rules of participation, extensive updates to MDS and payment systems, the increasing acuity that we are seeing and taking care of, and, and it goes on and on. Now think about how your staff react to those changes. Do you see panic and anxiety? Or do you have staff who are always enthusiastically wanting to engage in the next big thing? So whether you are a formal leader in your organization or an informal leader, um, like the CNA that we've had attending most of these sessions from the veterans home, I'm not sure if she's on today, but I'd love to call her out. So Kelly, if you shoot me your name, we can call her out. Um, but 
As a leader, you can support your team members by helping them recognize that change is inevitable and you will be doing, you will do better by being ready for it. Next slide. So there are lots of methods out there to support change management. Um, I have pulled out a few of the base understandings of ways to help your staff be ready for change and willing to accept it there, you know, if this is something you want to delve deeper into, we can certainly go into that more in these sessions or just looking online. Um, there's a whole science behind about behind change and accepting change, but I'm just going to go over um, five of the elements that can help you support your staff um, accept and be ready for change. So first is awareness. Um, for every action that you consider, be sure that you understand why that particular action is indicated. For instance, if we're needing to move our cheese supply, um, we need to com clearly communicate these, the reasons that we have to move it to our staff. And while those reasons may seem obvious to you, they may not be obvious to others, um, especially those that are working day in, day out with their head to the or nose to the grindstone that don't get a chance to look around at the bigger picture. They're working on um, their tasks with their residents. They might not see that bigger picture. So make sure you're communicating why we need to do that. Um, sharing your thinking with people around you and the people affected by the change. Um, and once folks understand why we need to make things change, um, you must help them understand how change is beneficial to them to create a, de a desire to implement these changes. Um, at times, this can take some finessing um, because it's not always easy to translate new rules into a benefit for the individual worker. But tap into why your staff are in the role that they're in. Do they care deeply about these residents? Um, then focus on how these changes are a benefit to the resident. Um, we need to look at their, their knowledge base. Um, people need to understand how they can contribute to the team. They need the facts, the data, the knowledge of new best practices. Um, this helps us all get beyond fear when we understand um, the right ways to do things um, and science behind it. Um, they need access to continued learning, to continue to get better and provide better care. And after gaining knowledge, individuals must develop the necessary skills and abilities to perform these tasks. So how to maneuver through the unknowns of the maze. This is where um, your auditing and peer coaching can come in to support the change implementation. And finally, reinforcement, that our new practices are the new normal. Readdress what everyone has learned and the impact that those changes have made for your residents. Communicate that often, give lots of feedback and support. I just wanna mention again, um, we, uh, Dr. Jervich had talked about getting uh, one of these books for, by David Farrell for anybody who expressed an interest in that. Um, there are lots of examples um, in that book about how changes were put into place, but also how he documented them and brought them back to the staff so they could really see how even small incremental steps impacted the overall success of the facility. So if you're wanting one, please let the UND team know that you want a copy of that book for your facility. Um, next slide. Um, I just briefly wanted to share this IHI model for improvement graphic that lays out the steps for understanding and planning for change. Um, we need to be able to articulate what we are trying to accomplish. How will we know that the change is an improvement? And this is often where the data comes in and then identify what changes can we make to result in improvement? What interventions are we going to trial to see that um, said improvement is, is a success? We trial those interventions by using the PDSA cycles, which is just pilot testing. We see what was successful and what we want to adopt and spread. If we were kind of successful and maybe need to tweak that intervention a bit, we can adapt it to our own setting, our own residents, um, or if our pilot test was a fail and we need to abandon that idea and trial some other intervention. And next slide. And just a quick reminder of, I just truly do feel that one of the most dangerous phrases that we can hear 
in probably anywhere, but I definitely feel it in long-term care is when somebody tells you, well, we've always done it this way. That is not a reason for continuing to do anything the way that we have been. That means that we need to investigate and make sure that this is the best way. So, all right, thank you. So thanks, uh, Michelle. Uh, there, there's some conversation before we get into the uh, self-assessment here. Um, so Melissa had brought up uh, as to what to do with people who don't accept change. So I think that's really a good um, icebreaker question, you know, to, to open up for discussion. Um, so uh, in my lexicon, I call those people refuseniks. Um, maybe it's my Eastern European background or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are, those are people that are hard stops, right? They, um, as I think indicated in the chat box, uh, they, they tend to be kind of, they know what they know and you know, they're, you're not gonna budge them one, one direction or the next. Um, so in, in quality improvement, there is that bell-shaped curve. Uh, so you've got people on, on the upper end of that curve that are the uh, early adopters, right? They, they see change as being, you know, kind of, I don't know, as I was watching the uh, Teddy Roosevelt documentary last night, you know, Teddy Roosevelt just kind of, you know, charged up the hill all the time. And he was famous for that. You know, he was, he was a change agent. Um, and then, you know, right in the middle, it's, it's, and it's no different than how we're seeing people uh, accept or decline or wait uh, for the uh, COVID vaccine, right? You know, you've got people in the middle that say, ah, we're going to wait and see and, you know, let other people test drive that vaccine first. And then we'll, we'll see if, if, if we'll get it or which one we want. Uh, and then finally, at the other end of that bell-shaped curve are those, you know, a uh, few individuals that are uh, just, just not adopters. They just, you know, like I say, it's part of that, um, you know, stamping their feet down in that, uh, you know, old cheese room. Although I've, I've, got to, I've, I've got to beg to differ with that video there. Um, I, I think sometimes cheese, cheese is like age, mature with age and get better. <laughs> so I take a little umbrage about the, uh, about the cheese reference there. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if anybody else wants to point out. I think um, uh, Wanda, uh, you had some comments. I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself and just you know, share some of your thoughts about how to deal with folks. You, you had some comments there. Got unmuted. Sometimes I find just if I, sometimes those people that are hard to change, you tend to maybe not spend as much time with them. I think sometimes when you seek them out repeatedly and just so that they know you're still looking at it and you're trying to bring them along, I just sometimes find if I spend more time with them now and then and here and there, it seems to help a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great observation. What, one of the things that um, was, was a commentary when you have uh, two polar opposites, uh, one way to try to find common ground and agreement, or, or, well, common ground is to agree with their point of view. You say, I, I agree with you up to this point, or I agree with what you're, you know, how you're seeing this. So you have some sort of, um, I don't know, um, a peace offering, if you will, right, uh, that, 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 that you find that there is some agreement between the two of you, and then you can use that as a point of discussion. Um, the other point is, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, use not yourself as a leader, but also peers to help develop an attitude or, 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 or change. So uh, we were talking about the buddy system, you know, so maybe encouraging that individual's buddy to kind of you know, talk it up and get a little bit more, you know, information. It's a long process. It's, it's like, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this model. It's called the uh, Prochaska uh, theory of, uh, or trans-theoretical model of change. You know, so it's like, how do we change our bad habits? And, and they're very small and they're very incremental. And the idea is that, you, you know, you just try and make a small change. And so too, with you have somebody with, you know, resistance, um, you know, you try and find, some commonality. Uh, and then also I like the idea of um, uh, kind of empowering them, uh, you know, and then uh, kind of, you know, putting them in charge of something and letting them, letting them go, you know, with, with not letting them go, I'll 
the door, but letting them go with the project, um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to see if they can get better results. And, you know, they may find it, it's, it's a little tougher than, than they thought. Um, so Leanne was mentioning, always add the why, this is the change and this is why. Leanne, do you wanna comment a little bit about that if you don't mind unmuting yourself? Okay, well, well, we'll give it a few moments there. If, uh, Leanne, you wanna um, pipe in here, that, that, that's perfectly fine, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, does it, uh, Kelly, do you have any other comments about dealing with the refuseniks? No, I think those are great ideas that were put on there. And, you know, really it, the empowerment going back to that, when people feel like they own a process or a system, they take ownership in it, they're more likely to uh, buy into it. And the other comment I would make is that if you have a unit that truly excels at a change that you've put in place, maybe that person can work on that unit. And then you're surrounded by people who are, who are um, living this change and there's been positive results. So they can actually see it in action because as Michelle had put on the last slide, the, this is the way it's always been done. Yes, everybody, they're gonna go back to that as long as they see that the results they need come from that. So once you move them to a different unit where it is working, maybe they can actually see that the change is successful and buy in a little more. Yeah, yeah. So, so thanks. I mean, this is these are uh, good thoughts, and and you know, as we share these ideas for strategies, I think the, these are uh, this is exactly what we're looking for in these sessions is to uh, you know shared experiences as to how to approach that. All right. So now some really good news. Uh, we're we're going to do a uh, what I consider a workshop. Uh, uh, or this is active copy. This counts. So if you don't have that check sheet from the uh, that we sent out to you for the copy self assessment, uh, just if you don't mind recording on paper what your answers are to each of these questions, and then print that that document out, and then just fill in your answers. You you will have now done the 2021 uh, self assessment. So uh, this, this should go into your binder or however you collect your um, documentation for, for Quapi. So let's go for the, uh, let's start the poll. So uh, our facility, first question, our facility has guiding principles for how Quapi gets incorporated into our work. So it's again on a, a pretty much a one to five scale. Um, you know, where, where, where do you feel you are in this process? Okay, so just record your answer. I would just uh, record it. Uh, question one, just put down uh, A, B, C, D, or E, um, and then you can fill in your, your, your chart if you don't have that in front of you right now. And then uh, question two, we have found a way for all service lines and departments to engage in QAPI, uh, and, and that's all sharing in the same PIP, not necessarily having individual departments do their own PIPs, by the way. So this, this should cut across all either service lines or all departments. So the PIP should be system-wide, department-wide, or all department-wide, I should say. Okay, so question three, we have a written QAPI plan that is used by and across all departments. Also importantly, you might just as a side note, ask if uh, folks know where that QAPI plan is. So if somebody happens to wander into the facility and say, show me your QAPI plan, they don't look at you like with glossy eyes, like deers and headlights. Number four, our facility leadership is regularly apprised of our QAPI activities. So whomever that may be, if you ask them, you know, what, uh, was the most recent PIP or quality improvement discovery, uh, they should be able to give you that kind of feedback. And question five, uh, QAPI is a priority for us. And again, QAPI in the sense that it's uh, part of your decision-making process. So if you're not sure if it's part of your decision-making process, then um, you know, uh, I would suggest uh, not being sure about that question. And then finally, uh, number six, QAPI is integrated into uh, new staff and their onboarding. So uh, do, they, do the new staff get introduced to quality improvement in some manner? And if you respond to that, that would be good. 
And we should be able to see all of our results here shortly. So once you have your answer submitted, we'll, we'll get our summary statement here and see what the range is. Okay, so for question one, uh, so good, Quapi gets incorporated into our work. Uh, so it looks like uh, we're about 50-50 uh, there with that. So there, uh, there's the expected range. So that's good to see. Uh, question two, we found a way for service lines to engage in Quapi. Uh, so I think it's uh, you know, looking like uh, most of the folks are at least above just getting it not started for sure. Uh, so that, that looks pretty good. Pretty even distribution there. Uh, a QAPI plan uh, that's used by all departments. Um, so again, even distribution, um, about 33% for each category there of getting there. Question four, uh, our facility leadership is regularly apprised of our uh, QAPI activity. So it looks like everybody's doing that, that's great. And that everybody in question five endorses QAPI as a priority. That's outstanding. And then number six, uh, uh, onboarding. So it looks like folks are uh, uh, either uh, trying to get this started or jump started. So that, that actually looks as a group for us, uh, an area of uh, potential uh, improvement and, and quality improvement. So what we would like to do with that kind of information is understand how uh, you would like to have that onboarding done. So for instance, if we can, uh, our group at the University of North Dakota uh, can provide a, a, um, a, a, a short video or introduction to quality improvement as part of your onboarding process, um, that, 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 that could be an ask, right? So as a group, if you're interested in something like that, that's something we could uh, actually design as a PIP uh, develop the little video, uh, have it distributed, you test it, and then you get back to us. And, and uh, if there's a pre and a post you know, question as to whether anybody learned anything from, from that video for quality improvement. So that's, that's great. All right, good, good job. Uh, so you're halfway there. We're going to do the other half of this QAPI self-assessment next week. Uh, so make sure you have your, um, like I say, your, your, the, the printout of your uh, QAPI assessment that we sent out to you. And if you didn't get it, let us know. Um, and we'll finish the uh, second half of that next week. All righty, next slide, please. So for next week, we're gonna uh, start getting uh, our elbows or sleeves rolled up uh, to our elbows, hopefully, <laughs> uh, for uh, looking at a PIP around residence-centered care. So I just wanted to uh, do a quick walkthrough as to, uh, and get some feedback as to uh, how we conceptualize this. So next slide, please. So in the chat box, uh, give me a, uh, just if you could, could provide us with an example of what 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 would represent uh, resident-centered care. And uh, my 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 contribution to that question would be uh, being able to offer different um, levels of hot sauce, <laughs> going from mild, moderate to really really hot. Great. So it looks like. Um, So, so bedtime is, uh, and wake time is good. Yeah, and another point is personalized activities. I think that that's good. So anytime there's choices. Um, yeah, so ad, ad lib uh, bathing, uh, I think is, is a good one. I, I was just gonna, as a side note, I just read an article that uh, for, for all those that have the Norwegian or Northern European blood in their system, uh, they, they discovered if you take five saunas a week, you don't get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so if that's, an, if that's not an endorsement of the Finnish sauna, I don't know what is. Okay, so great. We're putting in some more uh, comments there. I'm just reading them off there. Uh, what, uh, what they prefer to eat, that, that's great. I'd like to know a little bit more about that, how you give them you know, that, that kind of choice. Facility I, I worked at is if they didn't like the um, uh, daily meal, uh, they could always choose a hot dog, which I always thought was kind of kind of weird because if they didn't like hot dogs, then they were kind of out of luck. Um, yeah, so the care plan shows the care resident needs. That's 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 very good to have documentation for that. Again, it looks like a couple people are doing different bathing schedules. 
and uh, preference to eat when they when they want. And then also again, uh, Allison, you know, is pointing out being aware of the resident's history uh, and life prior. Uh, so, so that's always good. Yeah, and I, was, I, I always want to mention that sometimes uh, residents have aspirational thoughts, you know, that they want to do something, but they may not be functionally ready for that yet. So I think it's always important to, in the care plan, to point that out. All right, good night sleep program. Yeah, we, we're going to talk about sleep hygiene uh, at some point during these sessions. Uh, I want to share with you best practices for sleep hygiene with, with the older adult. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for sharing these uh, thoughts. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So just by definition, uh, resident and family-centered care uh, is basically an approach. Um, it uh, assures residents' preferences, that they're uh, both valued in the system and that they're respected, uh, and that the care that we deliver uh, is done so with dignity and respect. Uh, again, it's an exchange of information. I like everybody's comment about that, you know, is that trying to establish what the routine was before and then, you know, trying to a, a, a adapt, you know, to a, a more institutional setting. Next slide, please. And we can recognize patient uh, or resident-centered uh, care uh, by basically getting rid of that assembly line approach, you know, so the idea of uh, food choices, uh, sleep pattern, uh, choices uh, are all uh, good examples. Um, and then trying to improve the quality of care for residents. So we, we, we'd like to measure that in some fashion. And that's what we're going to try and direct our attention towards uh, this, this uh, upcoming uh, next three weeks is uh, looking at uh, resident-centered care and identifying projects that we can uh, uh, move the needle uh, on, on uh, resident-centered care. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, developing uh, person-centered care, uh, we wanna make sure we equip staff with the relevant knowledge and also give them authority, right? To have, give them decision-making authority to make those changes on behalf uh, of, of the resident so they can initiate that. Um, and also we want to promote collaboration. Uh, so those collaborations might be a resident council, might be a family council, and of course the ombudsman program. Next slide, please. So just comparing uh, business as usual on the left side uh, versus patient or person-centered, resident-centered care. Um, you can see that uh, rather than a top-down strategy that the person-centered care uh, is, is a cooperation uh, and you empower the staff uh, to uh, recognize uh, uh, resident preferences and try and make those adjustments accordingly. Next slide, please. And the benefits, uh, I think are, uh, we, we understand these benefits. Uh, you get more autonomy, uh, decision-making, and even people with uh, memory loss should be afforded that personal autonomy. Um, we, we can talk about decisional making capacity and how you decide whether somebody has decisional making capacity and so forth. There's actually a formal tool uh, for doing that and that's more helpful for family members. Uh, but again, trying to maintain that autonomy is so, so important. And then also uh, for each of uh, activities, whether they be, uh, as we saw with bathing, um, you know, all, all the activities of daily living as to what kind of choices are, are, are available and whether they're imp actually implemented. Um, just reviewing some of the uh, uh, F tags throughout the region here, uh, that, that, that is, you know, that, that uh, resident choice uh, is one of the things that comes up uh, periodically as, as a uh, citation. Um, and then, you know, just the other the last two points there is that uh, making sure you develop staff who are in tune with the resident preferences. That's why the continuity is uh, so, so important with, uh, you know, resident assignment um, and, um, you know, have, having a group that knows what, what, what the routine is for, for those individuals. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, staff benefits, uh, I think there's, there's something to be said for uh, the, the rewards of uh, partnerships with residents and, and their families. Uh, and quite honestly, even the most difficult families can be a rewarding relationship, you know, as you recognize that sometimes they're always gnawing at you. Uh, but as you get to know them, 
uh, you can anticipate some, some of the uh, issues and uh, sort of take that deep breath uh, and then work with them uh, and work it through. And they're, they're, they really are appreciative uh, of, of that effort. Um, and then also for the staff, uh, being, having that feeling of being valued uh, that they really are contributing. So having a recognition program uh, is, is so, so important to acknowledge those um, uh, input uh, for, for, for the uh, staff in uh, supporting patient-centered care. And then finally, the, the last slide there is benefits. Yes, there we go. Benefits for, for the facility. Um, so uh, the facility becomes more facile. It's able to identify and respond appropriately to uh, the changes. This is really important as, as people have a functional decline. Uh, how do you change those preferences uh, with, with that functional decline? Uh, of course, you know, we all want good reputations. We all uh, 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 appreciate the referrals uh, to uh, facilities being recognized. And quite honestly, that's why we're all here today uh, is to seek a, a, a higher level of quality. And then finally, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, increased staff uh, retention. And, um, and, and that's always an important consideration. All right, uh, so there are tools uh, that, that look at uh, preference satisfaction. Uh, and so I don't know if you use a tool, but again, the, the theme of this whole program is to adopt uh, tools that make sense for your uh, facility if you don't uh, have them. Uh, there are published tools out there that will distribute to you. It's just like you know doing the walk rounds, right? Using using that tool of structured questions uh, really really puts it in a um, it, that helps you maintain quality. Uh, so the whole point of quality improvement is to do things on a, on a structured basis uh, so that you get consistent results with with each time. Uh, you can imagine a, a, an assembly line, um, you know, where where uh, quality. Uh, goes in you know three different directions because they have three different lines. Um, it, it's difficult to uh, maintain quality unless you're monitoring or evaluating uh, what 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 each of those lines are doing. Okay, I think that um, we just want to talk about next week's uh, action. I don't know if you want to call it homework. Um, so we'd like you to uh, answer these questions. Uh, we'll, we'll send these out again by email. Uh, is to where do you store your PIPs? Are they on uh, a hard drive uh, and or uh, a booklet? And who has access to those? So that, that's the second question. And then what we want uh, to reflect, uh, you know, so after this session is reflect on uh, some additional ideas that you would have for a resident center care intervention. Uh, so if it's undisturbed sleep, uh, things like, do you use uh, bright light therapy in your facility to uh, facilitate sleep? Uh, do you use uh, melatonin uh, to reset the 24-hour uh, the cycle? Uh, as we get older, we're actually on a 25-hour cycle, not a 24-hour cycle. So how does melatonin uh, impact that? Um, uh, a, a, a warm bath or warm shower, uh, you know, what, what impact that might have on sleep hygiene? Uh, and... Uh, we talked about uh, food preferences. That could be another uh, PIP. Uh, and then also uh, looking at staff with uh, you know, consistent uh, assignments. So, and then I just see, um, so, so that's gonna be the homework. We'll uh, send a reminder out for that. Um, and uh, I just see that uh, Michelle put in the Advancing Excellence campaign. Um, but uh, and she has the tool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in this process, by, by the way, I see that um, uh, Leanne's talking about a good night's sleep program. Uh, you know, if we can share that uh, next next week, you know, with some of those things that you have done, I think uh, that that would be a good uh, a, a good use of our time just to share our successes with with these kinds of uh, resident uh, preference programs. So um, that's my final thoughts there. We um, but I did want to mention um, the reason that we're having you guys kind of think and reflect more on the resident-centered care um, idea is that we're going to um, begin, I believe, next week or the following week in having you guys create PIPs related to resident-centered care and going through the entire PIP process. So um, I believe our either next week or the following week, we're going to be doing root cause analyses with you. Um, and hoping that you kind of implement that process at your facility. Correct. So just as a reminder, we're going to be going through three 
three different uh, rotations of PIPs. Uh, the first one will be focused on resident center care. Uh, the following uh, four weeks will be uh, focused on uh, quality care. And then thereafter that one uh, will be uh, safety. Okay, so we're just gonna rotate those, uh, those themes and uh, develop a PIP. So you'll have uh, a PIP per month uh, you know, to uh, uh, demonstrate your, your uh, QAPI activity. And like I say, uh, next week we will complete our self-assessment. And so you can put that in your binder as uh, having completed your self-assessment. And we'll, we'll give you the distribution uh, of the results today uh, for, for that. Uh, so you can show what the standard is uh, for um, our, our uh, uh, collaboration, you know, as to what uh, the, the QAPI readiness is for our group. Great, does anybody have any questions? We've been sort of chatting it up here. Okay, um, good. Well, um, thanks so much for your attention. Uh, love, love the mice. I'm gonna go get a piece of cheese for lunch. Um, and uh, <laughs> I wanna thank our uh, mentors uh, and also our uh, uh, facility uh, peer mentors. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. We'll send out the email with the, uh, uh, the homework again, if you, if you didn't get this down. And uh, we'll go. We'll go from there.